so let me proceed. Um, and I first want to, I also want to mention that Mayun Chung Smith is the uh, course manager at Oakridge National Lab. And I think you have her email and contact information that she uh, will be able to answer all sorts of uh, questions that you might have. Briefly, the elements uh, organizationally that we have in the course are uh, lectures, Tuesdays and Thursdays, 4 until 5.15. Those are recorded and can be viewed, uh, if you so desire, online afterwards. Um, there will be homework, which is uh, closed on Thursdays and due on Thursdays. Uh, and each of us, as we teach, um, uh, as, as we lecture through, we do design homeworks that uh, are appropriate for that material. There might be some weeks where there's no homework, but uh, the general plan is that there will be uh, homework weekly. And then uh, we will have some form of a term project. Uh, this is a little bit in flux. Uh, and I'll, I think we'll get back to that um, uh, when it's been nailed down a bit more uh, closely. All right. Good. So, um, any questions so far on the organizational aspects of this? Have gone? It, there seems like there's still have a lot. Right. So I, I'm going to try to speak up a bit more. It's, it's kind of a, unusual for me, but uh, let me give it a try. Okay, so uh, please let us know still if, if uh, the sound is not uh, adequate. Um, I'll keep looking at uh, John Shackleton, and you can tell me. So I'm going to start off by saying a few words about the basic properties of the neutron. Um, basic properties of the neutron. And the first interesting property that you're probably aware of is that the neutron as a free particle is not stable. It has a lifetime of 881.5 seconds, uh, give or take. So approximately 15 minutes. And this has an important consequence in experiments. We cannot, once and for all, generate the neutrons that we shall use in an experiment. Uh, they're going to decay, and so they have to be produced uh, at um, either a fission or a spallation based source of neutrons. This aspect of it I won't talk about today, uh, but Steve Nagler will have discussions about uh, both the fission and the spallation production of neutrons. So, Neutron has a finite lifetime. Neutron has no charge as a penetrating form of radiation. We can actually get through sample environment equipment to access samples under very extreme conditions of pressure or magnetic field. Um, uh, and the other thing that that implies is that it's actually uh, predominantly the strong nuclear force that governs the interaction between neutrons and materials. So, lifetime, no charge. The other thing we can say about the neutron is that it carries a magnetic dipole moment. The magnetic dipole moment um, of the neutron is equal to a gyromagnetic ratio times the ratio of the electron mass to the neutron mass. And here's a little tip regarding nomenclature. Uh, we are talking so much about neutrons in this course that little m is not the mass of the electron, but the mass of the neutron. Uh, multiplied by the ball magnitude. Now, the gyromagnetic ratio of the neutron equals to minus 1.91. And overall, this factor is approximately equal to 10 to the minus 3. So, the neutron does have a dipole moment. Um, but it's actually only one thousandth of the dipole moment, magnetic dipole moment of the, uh, of the electron. Uh, it is a spin one half particle, so a fermionic particle. Uh, the last thing I want to say in terms of the brief uh, summary of basic properties of the neutron is that the mass uh, of the neutron is equal to. Uh, this number. Now, why is that important? That's important because that establish the, establishes the relationship between the kinetic energy and the de Broglie wavelength for the neutron. Let me just write down a couple of equations regarding that. The kinetic energy of the neutron would be as uh, any non-relativistic 
particle P squared divided by 2m, uh, which is equal to h bar k squared divided by 2m. Um, and this ratio that shows up, or this constant that shows up, is actually important experimentally, h bar squared over 2m. Turns out to be equals to, once you put this number in, and the Planck's constant is equal to 2.072 Newly electric bulk angstrom squared. And the fact that this number in these units is approximately unity uh, is actually uh, quite important for the use of neutron in probing, particularly the uh, dynamic properties of condensed matter. Let me say a few words about units of energy. Uh, that always gets us confused, and since we're just starting off here, um, I think it's appropriate that I would mention that one milli electron volt, I'm typically going to use the units of milli electron volt. One milli electron volt uh, is, equals to, um, is equals to 10 to minus 3 times 1.602 10 to minus 19 uh, joule. That's a unit of one milli electron volt. Perhaps not ter terribly, terribly useful there, but uh, what's perhaps more useful is that one milli electron volt is 11.61 11 um, 11 Kelvin. Corresponds to the thermal energy of 11.61 uh, Kelvin. So approximately 10 Kelvin per milli electron volts. Um, another unit we sometimes shall use is terahertz, and one terahertz is equals to 4.14 milli electron uh, milli electron volts. Okay, so what this means is that if I was to um, take a neutron beam uh, with a broccoli wavelength of one angstrom, just for argument's sake, then the wave vector would be equal to 2 pi over 1 angstrom, so approximately equal to uh, uh, 6.3 uh, angstrom inverse. And then the energy, the kinetic energy of that neutron uh, would be equal to this 2.072 milli electron volts times 6.3 angstrom inverse uh, squared, and then angstrom squared here. And that becomes approximately equal to 80, uh, 82 milli electron volts. So a neutron which has a wavelength similar to the spacing. Uh, between atoms in solids has an energy which is not too much beyond the thermal neutron, sorry, the thermal energy range. So it's sort of similar to the energy that one would associate with uh, optic filaments uh, in a solid for example. And this is very important for the use of neutrons in spectroscopic analysis um, as a use of probing uh, spectroscopy of materials. Okay, now I'm just going to briefly pause on here with a, uh, the sound is actually functioning, whether you can see what's on the board. Remotely, it's okay. Writing big is good. <laughs> and even better is better. Or even bigger is better. Okay. Uh, I will... Good. So that was the basic uh, properties of the, of the neutron. Now I want to uh, begin to talk about the theory of, uh, of scattering. And uh, yeah, it's a pretty straightforward uh, subject and principle. Um, and I feel it, it's appropriate that we would spend a little time uh, laying out the, the basic uh, story here so that you know where the approximations lie um, and how to connect the theoretical description uh, to experiments. And so the first thing I want to talk a bit about is the concept of neutron flux. So the flux is essentially like the, the current density um, and we typically denote the flux in the neutron beam by this symbol, the phi symbol, um, and it measures the amount of neutrons per uh, area unit per second. Uh, so if you think back to uh, subjects such as uh, electromagnetism, uh, then we would talk about a current density. And we will be able to calculate the number of neutrons or number of particles uh, 
passing through um, through some defined cross section of the time unit. And this would be equals to, if I think in terms of this flux, that would be equal to an integral of the, uh, the flux times a cross section of the area. We would probably want to take this to be a vector vector field in that case. Then this type of integral would tell me the amount of mutants per time unit passing through the area over which I integrate. So if I have some sort of region of space with a flux of neutrons, and I would like to figure out how many neutrons per time unit pass through this particular cross section, well then I would, uh, I would want to carry out this integral over this uh, cross section of the uh, flux uh, field dotted with dA, and I get the number of neutrons per time unit. Okay, in terms of the actual numbers that will uh, show up, uh, just to give you a sense for that, those are actually quite small numbers. Uh, so, uh, typical fluxes that we will encounter um, in terms of flux on sample would be something ranging from 10 to the fourth neutrons per square centimeter per second up to 10 to the ninth neutrons per square centimeter per second. These are very, very small flux numbers, much, much smaller than numbers that you get for photons uh, in a laser beam, for example. Some of you are working with uh, various types of very intense lasers, and you will find that these flux numbers are tremendously small. Uh, in fact, this uh, strongly impacts the way that we have to do uh, experiments. Okay, so that was the flux, and now I think I'm going to be doubling back to the board over here. Um, so, uh, next I want to talk about scattering cross section. Okay. Right. So, um, uh, I'm going to think about um, scattering cross sections in the, in the following very, very simplified uh, fashion. I want to write an expression for neutrons scattered uh, per time unit. Okay, and the experiment that I'm considering is. I have prepared some sort of beam of neutrons, which are going to be incident on uh, a, an object. And I want to figure out how many neutrons per time unit are going to be actually dispersed uh, from that object. And uh, certainly, that should be a number which is proportional to the flux. Did you have a hard time? So let's see, neutrons, neutrons, Added the time unit. So if we have some sort of linear situation, uh, which we will always be dealing with uh, here, then that should be proportional to the flux, the incident flux of neutrons onto this material. And um, uh, then there should be some sort of constant of proportionality because we, we agree that it should be proportional to the flux. We can talk about that constant of proportionality. Now, this constant of proportionality we call the uh, the uh, macroscopic scattering cross section for this um, for this material, for this chunk of material that we placed in the beam. And let's so let's call this scattering cross section. And why did I call it a cross section? That sounds like an area. It needs to be an area because flux, as you recall, is units of neutrons per time unit per area unit. What I have on the left hand side, neutrons scattered per time unit, uh, uh, does not have an area in it. So this guy has to have dimension of an area. So I can say that dimension of my scattering cross section is equal to the area. Okay, and we will be. Uh, the future are quite uh, continuously dealing with these uh, areas of, of, of scattering, like an effective area of scattering. Okay, now uh, I want to 
All the while, we will be doing some uh, theoretical manipulations or mathematical manipulations. I like to constantly sort of connect it back to the uh, experimental situation. And so uh, I'd like to do a little example here, which has some experimental relevance. I want to think about a situation in which I have a slab of material of some thickness. We call this thickness uh, d, dx, dx. And then I'm going to have a certain amount of neutrons per time uh, unit defined by some flux uh, incident onto this, onto this slab. Uh, now, as a result of the presence of this slab, there's going to be scattering. And so some neutrons will not make it through. They will be going off in all sorts of other directions. And then there will be some depleted uh, beam of neutrons, which will have um, which will have a uh, number of neutrons per time unit will be n plus dn. I'm going to call it a plus dn, even though this will end up becoming a negative number because I'm actually depleting the neutrons as a result of scattering. And I'd like to try to write down uh, the differential equation that tells me um, how the, uh, the amount of neutrons passing through the slab will depend on the thickness of the slab. Um, now, what I can say is that the amount of neutrons scattered according to this expression should be equal to the flux of neutrons, which are, uh, or let, let's do it, let's put this minus sign on, right, because this is depleting the beam uh, as a result of the scattering. I'm going to be depleting it by this amount. Uh, it will be proportional to the flux incident on the slab, and it will be proportional to the macroscopic uh, scattering cross section associated with that slab. Uh, now, here I'm going to make an approximation, which is that I'm going to consider this slab as composed of uh, many little scattering centers, and they could be, for example, molecules or atoms with a certain density, which will be rho. But this will be a number density, have units of inverse volume. Uh, and each of those scattering centers will have a scattering cross section, which I'll denote sigma. So this has the mention of area, that has the mention of inverse volume. And so um, what I should multiply by here is the macroscopic cross section of this material, which would be the cross section per scatterer multiply by the number of scatterers. And the number of scatterers that are going to be involved in this is going to be the area uh, that um, is presented to the neutron beam times the thickness, which was dx, times the density. This will end up being a number of, uh, number of scattering centers. And this is the scattering cross-section associated with each of those. <clears throat> now, uh, um, the number of neutrons, which is incident per time unit on this side, that should just be equal to the flux times the uh, times the area. So the number of neutrons interacting with these with this number of uh, of scattering centers. Uh, and at this point, I'm in a position to write down a differential equation. Uh, I can replace phi a by n, and then I have d n. I have dn equals to minus n sigma rho x. Uh, and here I can divide by dx on both sides, and I get my differential equation dn dx equals to minus rho sigma n rho sigma n. And we know the solution to that sort of uh, simple linear differential equation. Uh, it is that m of x should be equal to some pre factor e to the minus rho, sorry, yeah, rho sigma x. So there's going to be an, an exponential attenuation of the number of neutrons per time unit passing through, uh, depending on the thickness of this plate. So this tells you a means of actually attenuating a neutron beam by placing a scattering or an object that scatters uh, in that beam. Of course, you have to remember then that those neutrons are not lost. In this case, they're actually sent out uh, in all sorts of 
uh, directions. That might be uh, something you have to worry about uh, from a um, from, from a uh, health physics perspective, perhaps. But I wanted to talk a little bit about the characteristic length that's going to show up here, which is the cross section multiplied by the density. Um, and just to be specific, how are we doing for the image quality? Okay, still. So just to be specific, let's consider the case of water. So H2O. Okay, so, so for water, the density, that, and this is the number, uh, let, me, let me first talk about the, the scattering cross section for these two uh, atoms here. So the hydrogen, the scattering cross section for one hydrogen atom uh, is equal to 80, uh, the, uh, 82, uh, 82 bar. Now there's another interesting unit. Uh, let me just denote that one bar is equal to that's equal to 10 to the minus 24 centimeters squared. And that happens to be the general size of these cross sections that are going to show up. Uh, and so we introduce this unit of a bar. And um, so that's the cross section for hydrogen. Now for oxygen, the cross section is a lot smaller. Um, I'm going to have to open up. I didn't even actually write a uh, write block here. I think it's actually four, uh, approximately four bonds. So there you see how bad I am there. <laughs> so it's approximately four bonds in cross section for oxygen. Uh, but so we are really dominated by hydrogen in this case. Um, and let's calculate now what this characteristic length is for water. So one divided by rho sigma. And when you put in the number, this is about 10 to the minus. Uh, 24 and the density, uh, which I didn't calculate, but we can calculate that. That's about 10 to the 23 per cubic centimeter. Then you'll find that the, the length uh, for water is 0 0.18 centimeters. So approximately two millimeters is the one of the key length uh, just for water. And then neutron beam interacts with water. So that's actually a pretty short distance. You cannot go very far with water as a result of the very strong. Uh, incoherent cross section. Now, at this point, I should remind you that what I've written here is, is actually quite uh, an approximation. I'm neglecting all sorts of effects of coherence that are very interesting, but not so terribly relevant in this particular situation. This is some sort of approximation, but it gives us a pretty good feel for the characteristic what our E length of penetrating through that material. So that's what you get for water. Um, just to illustrate, that in fact neutrons are a very penetrating probe. Sorry, sorry, I'm um, uh, Let's calculate what that would be for aluminum instead. Uh, so let me erase this. And so if I was to instead look at a material such as aluminum, you'll find that the uh, cross section in that case is equal to uh, 1.5 uh, bond. Whereas the density, and remember that's the number density, number density for aluminum, uh, that, that happens just to show you how the calculation goes, 2.7 gram per cubic centimeter. And the molar mass is 27 gram per mole. And that would got a number 6.022 times 10 to the 23, so that's basically why you always end up with something like Round 10 to the 23. Uh, and so this ends up being equal to, um, to, I think it's about 0 0.6 times 10 to the 23 uh, inverse, inverse centimeters. And then the characteristic length in that case becomes uh, 1 divided by rho sigma, which is equal to 11 centimeters. So in aluminum, we can go through quite a distance but without having any scattering. And in fact, um, this was substantially an overestimate of the uh, amount of scattering that we would have. It, it's actually, in the case of aluminum, it's going to depend on coherency effects in such a way that for sufficiently long wavelength neutrons, we can penetrate much, much deeper than 11 centimeters. So we can be below what's called a Bragg cutoff. But that's a uh, complication that I have not yet brought into these uh, expressions. So, uh, I just want to, uh, to indicate that important for this type of expression in order to determine the mean free uh, path 
uh, for scattering uh, in materials. Okay, very good. So do you have any questions at this point of any, any other questions in this room or elsewhere? Yes? So why do you hide it in the cross-section? Yeah, excellent. So the question is why is the uh, scattering cross-section for hydrogen in particular so large? And I have to be honest that I would not be able to give you a very good uh, answer to that. This is a, a problem of, um, of um, uh, basically becomes a problem of nuclear physics to calculate these uh, scattering cross section cross the cross sections um, and uh, and this is done uh, there, are, there are also measurements very accurate measurements that are, that are done but I, I don't think there's a very maybe a later lecture will pick up on that theme but in my mind that has been sort of a, a, a facts that are that are cataloged and not particularly are particularly interesting, but they are very important. So we, we tend to have these long tables that read out these things. And indeed, hydrogen is very special. Uh, it is uh, one, I think it's the nucleus with the largest uh, incoherent uh, cross section. Now, I, okay, I, I could give you a little more indication there because uh, you know the hydrogen will be just the proton, which is also a fermionic particle. And so when scattering from a Another fermionic particle, we have a spin singlet and a spin triplet channel of scattering. And it turns out that the cross sections of scattering actually change sign in those two channels. And so if we have a uh, unpolarized uh, target of hydrogen, uh, then we have complete incoherence in this, in this uh, scattering process. But in addition, the individual uh, cross section of scattering in those two channels are also quite large. The, the different signs you might be able to understand from a single perspective, but a simple perspective, but I think the magnitude uh, is something I don't know a simple uh, Good. Any other questions? All right, I'm going to proceed. And um, uh, I want to, so, so far we talked about the transmission of neutrons through the target. So this is a very, very crude type of experiment or type of situation. Now we would like to begin to address the nature of the actual scattering. What is the distribution of scattering of neutrons uh, around this target? And what we're going to find is that that distribution of scattering will actually tell us a lot about both the structure and about the dynamical properties of the material. So this is basically why uh, we are so exciting about, excited about using neutrons to probe materials. It's because the pattern of scattering reveals a lot of information about the inner workings of the material. All right, so. Um, I have talked about the overall scattering cross section. Now I'm going to refine my experiment in such a way that it keeps track of the direction of scattering. Okay, so we want to think about a situation in which I prepare a beam of incident neutrons with some known properties. Typically, I'm going to use K to indicate the wave vector of this plane. Uh, plane wave state, um, and I'm going to be incident on a sample, and then I'm going to be measuring uh, the amount of scattering into some particular direction, which is indicated by k prime. Now, in this first description, the discussion today, we're going to be talking about elastic scattering. So the length of this wave vector will match the length of that wave vector. And the sample is a completely static object. It cannot absorb any energy at all. Um, so, um, so how am I going to construct this experiment? Well, I need to have a detector which will detect the neutrons which have scattered. And this detector will have to have some finite size. And so let's say that we place the detector up here and it has some uh, area which I'll denote by which I'll denote, denote by d a here of my detector. Uh, and the distance from the sample to the detector, I'm going to denote that by uh, capital, uh, denote that by R. I'm trying to be consistent with my later, uh, later uh, derivations here. Okay, so then the 
uh, type of measurements that type of measurement that would make sense is to measure the amount of new the number of neutrons that is uh, received in my detector. Um, okay, here I'm going to I'm a little uh, digression here uh, to indicate the following. So it actually doesn't matter whether I use a small detector close to a sample or a sufficiently much larger detector further from the sample. What really matters is what are the solid angles intended to the sample. And the solid angle is defined as dA divided by r squared. So this, I want to introduce that uh, feature of uh, the solid angle earlier. And the feature that it makes sense to then measure is the amount of neutrons scattered into solid angle d omega uh, in time, in the time t. But then I ought to divide by the number of neutrons that actually uh, impinged on the sample in that same time period. And that number of neutrons can be written as, as uh, the flux, the incident flux. Um, uh, times from the time that I uh, ended up ended up waiting. And then I should also divide by d omega here. Uh, because if I was to increase, uh, at least in the, from the infinitesimal limit, the size of the solid angle, then I would expect the number of neutrons detected to grow. And I'd like to cancel that out by having d omega also show up in the uh, denominator. And this fraction here, which is essentially the fraction of neutrons scattered into one particular direction of solid angle, I'm going to denote as the, as the uh, differential cross-section. So this is d sigma, uh, d sigma. Uh, and of course, this differential cross-section is related to the total scattering cross-section that I talked about previously in the obvious way. If I was to take a complete, an integral of this uh, differential cross-section and then integrate over directions, directions of the uh, scattered wave vector in the following fashion, then I should just get the total scattering cross-section back again. So that's just defining the uh, differential uh, cross-section. And that is for an experiment in which I'm only interested in the particular direction of scattering. I'm not keeping track of the energy of the scattered neutrons, because in this case, I'm really only thinking about the elastic and scattered neutrons. But later, we are going to introduce something called the uh, partial differential scattering cross-section, which actually also distinguishes the energy of the neutrons which are scattered. But later, we, that's what we'll deal with uh, at, uh, at a later stage. Uh, I want to remind you that the dimensions for this uh, differential scattering cross-section is going to be area per square area. And it's good to keep those things in mind as we uh, go forward and, and the formulas become more um, complicated. All right. So now our goal is to, to basically develop a means of calculating what this differential uh, cross-section will be in, in some form of general formalism which will then allow us to interpret the results of our measurements of that entity. And I'm going to start off in a pretty pedestrian and, and simple way, and then it will gradually work its way uh, up to becoming more and more realistic. How about a, a quantum? Theory of scattering. Okay, and if we're going to do quantum mechanics, we ought to have a um, uh, Hamilton operator involved. That's the, the formalism that I'll use. Um, and I'm going to start really very simple, uh, just by thinking about the free neutron, the neutron which um, does not have anything to interact with at all. Uh, it would have a Hamilton operator, which would just be momentum operator squared divided by twice mass. And the time independent Schrodinger equation would look like this H0 operating on a state which I'm going to call phi. And I'm going to give it a subscript k to indicate uh, that that would be actually a plane wave state. And this 
Actually, I can take a drop that just to simplify matters. Okay, so let's think about a state which has uh, energy E. It's just a, 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 a free neutron uh, moving completely alone in the world. This is, this is its eigenstate. Uh, then I'm going to slightly uh, complicate matters because this neutron will now encounter a potential. So this will be a description of potential scattering. This is, I didn't tell you where this potential comes from. Um, later we will give um, a more complete description, but for now you imagine that we're just able to somehow dial in some sort of spatially varying potential that this nuclear experiment is interact with in three dimensional space. Uh, that means that the new problem, now it's, uh, it looks like this, H, um, H will now be equal to H zero plus some sort of interaction potential. And so the time independent uh, Schrodinger equation reads H of psi equals to E, uh, equals to um, e psi. Now here I already said something uh, in a sense which was that I should be able to find an eigenstate of this uh, problem of potential scattering which has the same energy as the free neutron state. And in fact, that's the type of state that I'm going to be looking for now. I want to find the scattering state, so the state which has been influenced by the presence of the potential, but I want to find the state which is uh, similar to the initial free neutron state in that it has the same eigenvalue. It turns out to be possible to find such a state, and the way that I'm going to progress um, is I'm going to simply write down um, I'm going to simply write down uh, what works, and we'll show you that it does work. Uh, and so it will turn out that this state um, that I can write this state in the following fashion. Oops. In the following fashion. Psi is equal to uh, 1 over 1 minus GV operating on my initial State. So this would be the free neutron, and this is the state describing the neutron in the presence of the potential. Okay, now what is G? G is a Green's function, or G's fun the Green's function operator, which is going to take the following form. 1 divided by E plus I epsilon minus H0. So it is an operator, and it does depend on energy, and in order for this to work, that is to produce the state which has the same eigenvalue as the initial uh, uh, state uh, under no potential. Uh, in order to do that, then I should use that same energy in this expression. So that's my Green's function. So this is the so-called retarded Green's function. And for now, we're not going to be using it very much, but it is important to have this uh, this uh, small, um, small uh, imaginary value, which will eventually be allowed to go to the limit of uh, 0 plus. Ah, uh, good. All right, so I'm going to now show you that this is indeed an eigenstate of this uh, Hamiltonian. And the way to do that is we will uh, we'll rewrite this expression a little bit. I'm going to multiply by the denominator on both sides. And this will give me uh, that psi is equals to phi plus, um, plus g. Now, I like this expression quite uh, uh, quite a bit. I like it because I notice that in the limit where V vanishes, that is, if I take the potential away once again, then it actually falls back to the eigenstate of the free electron, the free neutron problem. So that makes sense. And then as I ramp up the potential, the strength of this term is actually going to gradually grow. And as we go forward, you will find that this part of the expression has to do with scattering. And we will be able to harvest from it, as we progress, an expression for the differential scattering cross-section. It will take a little while, we have to work through various uh, manipulations to, to reach that stage. And this part of the expression will basically be associated with the incident beam and the transmitted beam. So our focus is very much going to be on trying to understand the nature of this Particular expression. But first, I should show you that um, I should show you that this is an eigenstate to that uh, to that Hamiltonian, and I can do that by simply operating onto this expression by 
in inverse uh, or G inverse. And let me show you how that happens. Remember, G is written here. Uh, what's going to happen is that I'll get an E minus H zero operating on psi equals to G inverse operating on the um, on the free neutron. That actually just produces zero because Remember, this state is an eigenstate with energy E. So once I operate with that thing in verse, it just says, poof, what's uh, epsilon times small amount? So there's nothing there. But here, G in verse operating with that produces a 1. And then I have it just B times epsilon. And then you can see that if I rewrite this expression, I can move this one over there. That produces H0 plus B times psi. And in the end, I, I get my time independent. Coming right back out of that. So I've proven that um, that psi is actually an eigenstate um, of the problem uh, with the interaction. All right. Uh, good. Good. Uh, do I have any questions so far on all this? We have about 25 minutes, I think, uh, to go, and I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, uh, carry uh, carry on and. Um, for the rest of rest of the rest of the rest of the time today, I will try to develop this expression for the uh, for the eigenstate psi and its position space representation in order then to harvest an expression for the differential uh, scattering cross section. Hmm. Okay, so let me let me rewrite uh, the expression that I had over there. Psi was equal to Original function plus g g times psi, um, and uh, let's see, uh, yeah. So then, what I'm going to do is I will introduce this expression. Remember, that was my initial postulate for what that eigenstate should look like. I'm going to pop that one into this expression. Oh, this is a little bit. Of, a, of an interesting set of manipulations, but it actually produces a result that I like because it relates very directly to a certain aspect of the experiment. So I'm going to put this expression into here, and that produces the following plus g b 1 minus g b operating on psi. Okay, so this is interesting because I've now written the solution to the scattering problem in terms of just an operator operating on the solution to the problem where I have no scattering potential. And I'm going to be fiddling around a bit more with this expression. So I want to give a name to this entity that has shown up here. Now that entity is called the, the T operator or the T matrix. And I'm just going to write out exactly how that's going to be defined. So B is, in a sense, the way that we describe our a material as a scattering potential, and G is an aspect of the free neutron, the free neutron, you could also call it the neutron uh, propagator. Uh, so you can see that with this definition, uh, I have now the following expression, I have now the following expression for the, for the scattering state. Uh, I'm now the following expression, so I can just continue here, equals to phi plus, uh, plus g c phi. There you go. They look quite similar, but when I replaced b by t, I also replaced psi by phi. Okay, so you can see that if I could somehow figure out what t was, I would essentially have things, uh, things all sewn up. I know what my free Newton state looks like, and then I just have to operate on it with this T operator. This T operator is a little tricky. That's what it looks like. So let's take a look at that and try to simplify that uh, expression. And again, in doing this, I want to keep in mind that this part of the expression will end up being related to the scattering intensity. When this is strong, I have stronger scattering. So let me look at this expression for T, and I'll do that by, again, rearranging it in the following fashion, I can multiply by the denominator on both sides, and I'll get that T is equals to uh, B plus 
TGV. The zone operators, right? So everything C up operators. And this is an interesting expression because it's one that I can iterate in the following fashion. Um, I can I can rewrite B and then in place of T, I write this whole expression for T. So, right? so I'm gonna in place of this T, I'm gonna write this whole expression once again because after all that is what T is. So this becomes B plus T G B. That was my T, and then I have to write a G B again. And now I can I can uh, calculate this out and I get B plus B G B plus and then this term which is T G B G. And this type of exercise we can continue to do. Um, and uh, and when we when we would if we were to do that, then we, we find the following expression that T is equal to B, sorry, B times the summation n equals to zero to infinite g b raised to the n power. There's a whole bunch of terms in the series which is called the Born, uh, Born series. The Born series for the uh, T operator. <clears throat> Good. So in the limit where um, B becomes very, very small, we might be able to actually neglect all of these higher order terms, and then we would have T approximately equals to B. That would be what's called the Born approximation. Uh, and now let me give you a little uh, sort of experimentalist sense of the nature of this uh, expression uh, in the following way. So as I mentioned to you, uh, this term, which involves the T matrix, um, is the one which deals with scattering. When it's strong, we have stronger scattering. And so uh, each of these terms, in a way, has to do with a certain type of scattering process. So if you imagine that I have my sample here, I have a neutron incident on the sample, then I might have a scattering event in which the uh, interaction potential takes effect once, if you will, the neutron is scattered and proceeds to leave the sample. This would be an event which we describe in what would be called the Born approximation. I only need to figure out the potential as having acted, if you will, once. The next term, however, is one that involves the scattering potential twice. And so that would be an event in which a neutron comes in, then is scattered in some direction, uh, but before leaving the sample, it actually scattered again. And twice, the interaction potential operated, and also I propagated through the sample, and that's represented by this G, the appearance of G. Uh, um, and then I have this kind of uh, two-point scattering event. And then you can keep on uh, in that fashion, and you can have uh, events uh, that have many, many, uh, uh, that are deeply multiple scattering events that uh, could occur. Um, but actually, in much of what we will do in the way we want to describe Scattering, we will be focusing very much on the uh, Born approximation, but we only worry about this first type of scattering event. That would be sort of how we develop our expressions, but experimentally, we have to be aware that there are also these higher order multiple scattering terms to, uh, to handle, contend with. Okay, are there any questions so far that have come up regarding all this? No questions so far? Is it reasonably clear on the Born zone? All right. Good. All right. So then I'm going to um, I am going to try to make what I basically need to do here is to make a connection between these rather formal expressions for the eigenstates uh, in the presence of the interaction potential. I'd like to make the connection back to the differential scattering cross section. Now to do that. Uh, I need to develop a real space representation of this eigenstate. I need to know what my psi state looks like in real space. Um, and so, basically, um, I have my expression for psi uh, is, is, uh, is actually here, but I think maybe I will, I'm just going to simplify matters a little bit. 
expression dt and what I'm saying is that I need to develop the real space uh, representation of this uh, of this cat. And this I'm going to do by introducing this function, which I call psi k of r, which is equal to just the, the bracket uh, with my um, real space eigenstate, and then psi uh, here. And then here I'm going to get that's, a, that's this guy here equals to. And then here I would have the free Newton eigenstate, which is going to be a plane wave state, plus, uh, and then I'm going to have an R G T phi. Okay, so as we said, if I don't have any uh, interaction potential, this term just drops out, the T matrix vanishes, and then I just have my plane wave state. So the scalar state equals the plane wave. State that's not very interesting. So all of my efforts have to surround the calculation of this expression here. So let's let's see how that would actually um, how that would actually take uh, take uh, form. And so like, let's let's just focus entirely on that, and then we'll later I uh, will later come back to put it into this to this expression. So let me let me simply calculate this thing, and um, okay, so let me. Divide again, G, T, phi. Again, this is going to be a plane wave state. We sort of know what that means. I'm going to manipulate or develop this expression by introducing the identity operator 1 equals to the integral r prime uh, r prime. So this is the identity operator, and I want to pop it in right in this location. Uh, all right. So as a result of that, oh, I should have let me. I should have a. Sorry, that's the thing. That's P three. I have to take a full volume integral of all of these states. That would be the identity operator. So pop it in this location, and what do I get? I get that this thing now becomes equal to integral P three. R prime, and then I have an R G R prime, and I have matrix element of the T operator uh, showing up uh, as such. So basically, to proceed in my uh, in my goal of, of trying to develop the real space representation, of this term here, I need to uh, I need to further develop this expression. And this involves um, actually finding the matrix elements of this uh, of this uh, Green's function, and that's something that I think I'm going to actually leave you to do. And I'll, I'll have a little like a homework problem which will guide you through that little exercise. Some of you have had, I know many of you are quite advanced and, and could probably reel this off in a big hurry, and others may not have seen it for a little while. So I will invite you to uh, try to to carry out that. Um, very simple little calculation, in fact. And what you'll find, what you'll find uh, when you're done, and, and don't worry, as I said, I'll, I'll have a problem which will sort of guide you through that uh, little calculation. When you're done, you'll find that these matrix elements um, take the following, let's take the following form um, minus m over 2 pi. H bar squared x um, I K R minus R prime sorry, by R minus R prime. Okay. So that that takes a little that like, takes about 15 or 20 minutes to go. Through that calculation, but that's the upshot of it. It's a very beautiful result that involves the use of the Cauchy integration uh, in complex planes. It's quite a nice little exercise. Okay, so that's the expression, and now let's let's see how we're going to employ that expression. 
And you see that it, it's going to have to, again, my task is to calculate this part of the, part of the, uh, uh, part of the real space representation of the scattering eigenstate. Um, and that involves this type of integral. Now you'll notice that showing up in the expression is R and R prime. Let's examine where those belong in the problem. R prime is going to be uh, a variable that um, is in the matrix element with the T operator. Remember the T operator uh, has to do with the interaction potential. And so the T operator actually vanishes when I get very far away from my sample. So R prime is going to be a very small region of integration uh, where I actually have my sample. On the other hand, R is going to be the variable that I'm, which I'm going to want to explore all the way out to where my detector lies, way and very, very far away from the sample. So I'm surely in a regime here in which uh, I can comfortably say that I can comfortably say that R is much, much larger than R prime. Uh, let me uh, maybe make a little sketch, a little sketch of this. Um, okay, the board trace once again, make a little sketch. Um, so the, the, the concept we should have is that here's our sample. And here's our detector, which is pointed to by the R vector, because that happens to be where we're going to want to look at the value, look at the behavior of the uh, of the wave function uh, for the neutron under the effect of the scattering potential. Then we have the R prime vector, which is basically fiddling around inside the sample in the regional space where the T operator is finite. But it's a very, very small vector, half a centimeter or something, and the detector is way uh, way far away. And so what we're trying to calculate here is this distance, uh, which is r minus r prime. And because of the relationship here, this angle is going to be very, very small. Uh, and so basically, this distance can be, can be obtained by uh, saying, if this limit here, r minus r prime, uh, is going to be essentially equal to R. However, if this one has a projection onto the direction of R, if R prime is a projection onto the direction of R, then we ought to subtract off minus R prime dotted with R hat. Like that. So this is a scale as it, as it should be as dimension of a, as dimension of a length. So this is our approximation that we're going to use to actually uh, simplify this uh, expression. And um, <clears throat> Here, I'm going to use different approximations in different parts of the expression. In the denominator, uh, I don't care about this small uh, correction to R, so I'm going to just drop this entirely. Whereas in the, um, in the phase factor for this exponential function, it can actually be part of it. will become very, very important uh, that there are these uh, small uh, corrections as I calculate as I go and do this uh, position space integration. So I'm going to uh, write this expression as follows, minus m divided by 2 pi h bar squared. And then for this guy here, I'm just going to do e to the x i k r. That's, uh, that's the part, uh, that's the part which has to do with the first, with this part of the expression, uh, divided by my grossly simplified denominator, but then I have to pick up this additional phase factor, which has the form of x to the, and there was a minus sign there, so it's minus i, and then it was a k, and it was an r hat, and it was an r prime, like that. So this is the simplified expression under the approximation that r is much, much greater than r prime. Now, here, some, an interesting wave vector has shown up. That's k times r hat. Now, this wave vector is interesting because it is the wave vector which points from the sample towards the detector. So this is k times r hat. And this one I'm going to denote as a k prime. That is the scattered wave vector. So this is the first time it shows up, I think, uh, in our expression. So actually, uh, instead of having k times r hat, I'm going to replace that by k prime. And here I want to remind you that there's no sort of direct relationship between 
the reason that this guy has a prime and this guy has a prime. This guy, R, has a prime because I'm integrating of all of this uh, position space. K has a prime because it's the scattered wave vector. All right. Good. So now I'm going to uh, be able to make good progress with this uh, expression. Uh, however, I only have uh, several minutes left. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to now uh, have to abbreviate things slightly. Um, all right, so the idea here is that uh, instead of this function here, I can actually replace that by the following expression. K prime R prime. If this is a matrix L that will be uh, of the momentum eigenstate, the position eigenstate, uh, which you know is equal to 1 over 2 pi to the 3 half power um, uh, times x uh, minus i k prime dot r prime. Now uh, that expression is probably <laughs> challenging the camera. Okay, so this is uh, so this is how I would like to rewrite this uh, expression. Now you see that I only have the exponential part of it showing up, so I better multiply by that. Uh, on both, uh, on both uh, sides. And so I can actually rewrite this thing uh, in the following way. So replace this with, replace that with a k prime r prime. Oops, yeah, like that. Good. And then I've got to do good justice by multiplying by this 2 pi to the 3 half that I divided by one of those. So I end up with a square root of 2 pi showing up in the numerator. Now I'll warn you that in this calculation, the 2 pi is going to go from numerator to denominator. There's, it's quite easy to pick up a mistake of the divide somewhere along the way, but uh, hopefully we will not do that. Uh, anyway, what we've done is that we basically laid out this expression, and this is one that you'll probably calculate yourself, and then we made a, uh, an approximation relating to the different magnitudes of the distances involved, and we were able to rewrite the, uh, this matrix on it in terms of that expression. This is very, very convenient because this is now ready to copy into this expression up here. I, I really need to get uh, to completing this little part of the story or you'll be left in complete suspense, which we can't have. So, uh, so let me, uh, let me, um, uh, let me. Uh, this is the thing that I'm that I'm calculating, right? And this becomes equals to. I have all of my sort of numerical factors I can just pop outside, and those give me a minus m. What is it? Square root of two pi uh, divided by a plus squared. And this is very important. There's an e to the i. K R divided by R showing up. And then there is this interesting integral D3 R prime. And here comes the, the, the beautiful thing is that there's a uh, you said there's a K prime state, there's an R prime and R prime and there's an R prime here. And then I have my T operator, and then I have my, uh, then I have my, what is that? I have my phi operator, which is my um, uh, mean neutron uh, eigenstate, which I could also write as K, because that's simply a plane wave state. So that's K. And here's the nice thing that happens is now you see the uh, identity operator showing up. This is the total integral of R prime, and here you have the identity operator such that I can actually continue this expression and just get the following. And then e to the i k r over r, and then this matrix element of the t uh, operator, k prime t And uh, basically, um, what we are well on our way towards, but I think I should now uh, hold and we will continue this. Uh, we'll pick up on this uh, in the next lecture. We have lots of time to complete it. 
Uh, but what we're beginning to see is that this part of the expression, which I already uh, claimed to you was going to be related to the differential scattering cross-section, is seen to be connected to a uh, matrix element between the initial and the final state of the T operator. And just to remind you, this T operator was equal to B1 minus GB, which is approximately equal to B in the so-called Born approximation. So we're gradually getting towards um, recognition that uh, our scattering intensity will be related to a, a um, momentum space matrix element of the interaction potential, or in other words, uh, in fact, a Fourier transform of the interaction potential. But this is something we'll realize fully in the next lecture. So I think I should stop at that point and uh, entertain any questions that might have uh, arisen. Um, okay, we have silence so far. Do you have any questions on the, uh, how are you doing in the various uh, other places? Was it easily understandable? Uh, feel free to, to send messages or send emails. Uh, I hope maybe to hear from some of you uh, how this type of Blackboard presentation goes. An alternative is to put it all down in PowerPoint and, and so on, but somehow I uh, find it perhaps um, uh, generally more entertaining perhaps uh, to be doing it uh, live on the board. Uh, but let me know if you really feel it doesn't work, if you can't follow along uh, and see what's being written, uh, then we'll try something else. Uh, but so far we are on our way uh, in a relatively formal way, laying out the the, the framework for the expressions for the differential scattering cross section. And I'm going to be completing that in the next lecture. And basically, uh, the goal is to uh, lay things down so that uh, when Takeshi picks up, uh, he will be able to uh, be able to develop and discuss the expressions that are related more directly to probing the structure of the materials in the neutron. So, thank you very much, uh, and see you next Thursday at 4 o'clock.